as exciting. We'll be talking about enhancing frictionless cross-border payments for all. Again, the Bank of Thailand co-hosted with Thai Bankers Association and Payment System Office. And the next session, enhancing frictionless cross-border payments for all. We have the honor from the honorable guest speakers and also the moderator, Kun Paliwat Kanitasein, Deputy Director of Payment Systems Policy Department from the Bank of Thailand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome all the speakers on the stage. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to our session on cross-border payments. Let me first introduce you uh, to our panelists here. Thank you for being here with us. Um, first, we have uh, Mr. Subnendu Mohanti, the Chief FinTech Officer of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Please give him a hand. And then we have Mr. Shirish uh, Vadivka, the Global Head of Payments and Strategy from SWIFT. And then um, over there, we have Kun Kitipo Mutamara, the uh, Executive Vice President of Grung Thai Bank. Well, um, cross-border payments, uh, it's a very, very hot topic right now, and right here in Southeast Asia. Well, Singapore and Thailand, we've launched uh, Prompt Pay Pay Now, which is the first linkage of two fast payment systems in the world, and it was uh, launched last year. We won an award for it as well. And um, after that, it was followed by a flurry of uh, activities on QR payment linkages um, uh, among other countries in the region, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, I was recently in, in, in Singapore, and um, from the airport to the, uh, to the hotel, I was able to, to pay using my Grung Thai Bank uh, app. Uh, 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 by scanning the, the QR uh, there, so it was as convenient as, as a prompt pay um, payment. So uh, this is what we've been doing um, lately. And um, these new payment linkages are now offering cheaper, faster, more inclusive, and of course, uh, frictionless cross-border payments to all. Now the question for all of us here this afternoon is what's next for cross-border payments? We've been establishing several bilateral payment linkages, um, linking up uh, fast payment networks, but now there's also a, a multilateral uh, payment linkage in the making. Um, there's um, these new um, uh, payment linkages um, versus um, uh, what SWIFT has been doing for 50 years, right, uh, Mr. Shivish? 50 years, right? So linking up cross-border, uh, linking up uh, all the commercial banks in the world. And um, we have the issue of, of banks versus non-banks as well. So um, the new payment landscape would be characterized by banks and, and non-banks. How they regulated? What what banks? Uh, um, what do banks see uh, in, in 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 these new competitors? So these are the questions that we'll be discussing today with um, our very uh, esteemed speakers. Um, the speakers we have a, a central banker, Mr. Subnendu, um, a commercial banker, Kun Kitipong, and what do you call SWIFT? Um, I have here a global payments messaging network provider. Is that, is that well correct, done. Mr. Shirish? Well done. Yeah, OK. Uh, OK, um, so let's start here. Um, first round of questions to, to each and every one of you. Um, can you share your, your work, what you've been doing um, on, on cross-border payments, any pet projects you would like to, to highlight? Um, I'll start with you, uh, Chief Subnendu. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> thanks for having uh, all of us here. Well, uh, if you ask me what we are doing, I think there's a long list. Uh, uh, starting from uh, in 2016, uh, we had this uh, foundational uh, strategy in Singapore that to make a country truly a, digital, a digitally enabled country in terms of economic consideration, we got to get four things right. Our digital ID, our interoperable payment system, our trusted data systems and consent system, consumer consent system. So the second pillar was payment, in, uh, payment, payment infrastructure. Like Thailand, we, we, we created a proxy-based platform called PromPay like in Thailand and Pay now in Singapore. Uh, we also started thinking about uh, 
unifying our QR codes in, in Singapore, uh, unified our, our point of sales uh, devices in Singapore. So that whole set of cleanup was done last five, six years. And then we started doing cross-border with, to start with Prompe, now with India and Malaysia and hopefully more countries. But that's on the, on the account transfers. But on the merchant side, uh, we also started looking at making it the merchant payment, which primarily to my mind is not a public sector, it's largely driven by private sector. And we create a lot of incentives for them to, to, to build those capacity for cross-border uh, and domestic merchant acceptance uh, digitization. And that's broadly what we're doing for the last five, six years. Of course, we have exciting thing to talk about what is happening in the future after this round. So many things. Uh, uh, now to you, Mr. Shirish. So I think very interestingly, the same 2016 was when SWIFT started on its GPI journey, uh, which is where a group of banks got together and realized that there is a lot of, there's a, international payments were not really as smooth as they were supposed to be. In a world where you could you could trace the the you know a small purchase item you made on on a on a on a shopping portal right to your doorstep when you get alerts about you know it's the it's shipping is on its way the courier is on its way it has reached your door and you've signed when you had that level of traceability for a small e-commerce item we could not have that on payments that's when the when we realized as banks and using Swift together we said that this is, has to change and that's how GPI was born with four key things to deliver. GPI was born to deliver traceability, trans, uh, complete transparency on fees. It was supposed to have, it, is, it, has, it had a shorter SLA, so time-bound delivery of payments, and, and a promise that will deliver all information that was sent from the, from, the, from the initial of the payment right to the end of the payment. So that was how GPI was born, but that's not all we do in SWIFT. We also do a lot more on standards uh, which is to make sure that we do not end up with different parts of the world talking different languages and then we spend a lot more energy, money, effort in trying to convert it into a single format, a single conversion conversation. So standards and ISO 2022, if you have not heard about it, you should, is what we promote for international cross-border. We also do a lot more work on interoperability because we see a lot of digital islands across the world that need, could be improved for their own sake if they connect well. So if you really look at what SWIFT payment strategy has been, or as we currently say, it's quite aligned to the statement on this particular panel. Mm. Our, our, state, our strategy is quite simple. It says that transfer money in all its forms, or transfer value in all its forms, quickly, securely, and, and as seamlessly as possible for all. That's what the strategy of SWIFT is. So it is, it's, it's tremendous pleasure for me. Thank you so much for inviting me here because it aligns with what we do at SWIFT and I hope to communicate what more we can do with you guys uh, in the later conversations. Thank you. So good to hear that SWIFT has been uh, innovating all the time. Um, now to you, Kun Kiri Pong, Kung Thai Bank. Okay, thank you for having me here, right? Uh, first of all, when we talk about this QR cross border payments back in two, three years ago, right? Uh, Back then, we were thinking about something that how we're going to create some kind of same experience for the customers who are using a QR payment in Thailand. So, and back then, if you think, think about that, right? You see, we have about 5 million merchant acceptance point in Thailand, and we have about 3 million people using QR code payment there. So we think about how these people when they travel abroad. Uh, it's the first thing that we come to my mind is that how they're going to use the same experience that they adopt in Thailand mm. and go to other country with the same you know, experience there. So we start conversation with the uh, NETS, uh, Quara in Singapore. Uh, at the beginning, we just talking to like the bank partner. Uh, we see that, hey, we have a, some kind of a customer's adoption on the QR for both country already. And why don't we just do some kind of like exchanging some messaging because of when you need to find the merchants for make payments, right? It's very simple, you just translate those messaging back to Thailand. At the same time, when Thailand scan the uh, QR code in Singapore, vice versa, right? We can exchange the data, and we try to make sure it's very simple as much as we can. So we just launch it, and when we don't to scale it up, we see that hey, why don't we just connect with the ITMX with our local uh, switching here, and connect with the uh, switch in in Singapore. Now we can have more banks and joints on this ex same experience like KTB doing. So that, that's on the payment piece, right? On the limitants, we're also thinking about something like uh, how are we going to 
offer this kind of service to a very end customer. Uh, that three three principles that we set up uh, there with the Bank of, Bank of Thailand as well. Three things is the simple, secure, and also safe cost for them, right? Because we, we do transfer money, it's cost uh, very costly when you transfer some kind of small money. Uh, at that time, we don't have any services for those customers who actually want to receive or sending money with a low value. So that's why the prompt pay pay now has become one of the things that we can serve, uh, serve those kind of needs of the customers by stick with the three principles, simple, secure, and, and safe cost. Thank you very much. Simple, secure, and safe cost. Uh, uh, three key principles that, that we should remember. Uh, now, um, we've been talking about Prompt PayPay Pay now and, and several QR uh, payment linkages that, that uh, Kun Gitipong and his bank has, have, have been uh, establishing with other um, countries in the region through our operator and ITMX. Um, so various bilaterals uh, uh, are flourishing uh, here in Southeast Asia, but there's also talk about multilateral linkages because um, uh, if, if we keep spending resources and time uh, developing one bilateral, it, it takes quite a while to, to uh, reach uh, every country in the world, right? So um, with this uh, in mind, um, how do you see um, Chief Subnendum, the uh, question of, of bilaterals versus uh, multilateral linkages? Um, uh, what, what benefits do each have and, and uh, how do you see the future? Sure. I think uh, we, we, we have to ap appreciate that the Thailand prompt pay, pay now connectivity is many sense a very significant milestone in the payment network. Because the first time two domestic network of two different jurisdiction of completely different rules and regulation are able to talk to each other. And why I say this significant? Because it took us three years to do it. Mm. Uh, despite on the, on the paper it looked like similar prompt pay, pay now, proxy based system, you would wonder that why, why couldn't we do it in a few months? Mm. It took us three years. Why? Regulations were different. The processes were different. There are certain rules were different. And it's very hard to go and change that to make it work instantly. Now, the, the learnings we had out of the prompt pay, pay now connectivity, we did make it better to our next country. The next country we're connecting now is India. And we have achieved the human productivity, which is nine months. Mm. So India is getting connected within nine months because all the lessons learned from this Thai-Singapore connectivity, we could optimize in India corridor. But India is far more complex than Thailand. At least in Thailand case, we don't have that much complex capital control rules. In <laughs> India, it is extremely complex because the outgoing money from India has got a lot of forex control rules. And when you are doing this straight through point-to-point -point transfer, it's, it's going to be a completely difficult, complex process. So you have to automate all this piece. Then came along um, Malaysia. And Malaysia is relatively simpler than India and Thailand because very similar structures we have in... Uh, and plus, the way regulators are organized also makes a huge difference. Malaysia, like Singapore, is very similar. Of course, of course Malaysia has a separate uh, supervisor and, uh, and central bank. But Singapore has the advantage of a single structure supervisor and, and central bank. We could do many things yourself. You have your AML regulator somewhere else. So we have this complex multi-regulatory challenge. So imagine if you do it to every country, you will just go crazy. And it costs a lot of money, a lot of money. Millions of dollars are spent when you do bilateral connectivity. So the, this is not a sustainable process going forward. But before I go to the multilateral connectivity, the question you're asking ourselves, what is the use of this domestic payment connectivity? And based on the data we are seeing today, it seems to me, Low value, cash transfer will be the preferred way when it comes to uh, choosing the network. It will be this domestic payment connectivity. Because what we observed between the Thailand and Singapore connectivity that a migrant worker in Singapore are remitting back home four times a month. Roughly they get a thousand dollar or some eight hundred dollar to save in a month. And earlier they used to wait once in a month to send money back home and that took paying 10-15% of expenses. Now they are doing every week, which means in their mind it has become a local transfer, small value transfer. And that psychological break is a huge, huge social impact on bottom of the segment population. 
So it has added its value. We know that we need this network. Now the question is, shall we make it a multilateral connectivity to make it efficient? Well, on paper it looks good. We did a project with Bank for International Settlement called Project Nexus, which went through this complex process. There's an architecture document. There's a governance structure recommendation out there. And it talks about how multiple countries can come through a common gateway and able to replicate, able to participate together for a multilateral uh, infrastructure. But I can tell you, when we'll actually start doing it, it will become more complex. And I was chatting with, uh, at what time, my morning with him, saying that, how do you, how do you cover your liability risk if, some, if somebody, yeah. some, somebody hacks into this multilateral single gateway, a single point of failure, how does that entity guarantees or covers the liability for any, 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 ethic, any hack on the system? So that this complex governance, regulatory, um, uh, and, uh, and alignment of different re countries' regulatory practices to build this multilateral connectivity. So while the intent is there through Project Nexus, we will do it. The good news is ASEAN Plus 5 have announced their intent to come together, including Thailand to build this common uh, infrastructure. Uh, I think that's the way forward, but I will tell everybody in the audience, don't think that will be simple. It will be perhaps more complex than this bilateral. Who knows? So let's see how it goes. But my sense is that there's no other way. If we truly want to build a super scale, low value, point to point transfer of money, we have to go through the multilateral way. Maybe there's on the way down there, we'll figure out a better solution, a better approach some regulatory compromise has to happen between the regulators to align themselves for common good. Mm -hmm. Unless we get that, it will be very difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. So that's my sense briefly on the multilateral connectivity. We are optimistic we'll get there in a few years. So not just good on paper, but yeah. reality as well. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah it's, 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 a very <laughs> it's a very complex process. And the reason why SWIFT still survives for 50 years because of the complexity. Uh, and we, we do, we sometimes, when you remove this correspondent bank, you realize how much manual work they do, which you don't realize. And when you try to automate, it's just a complex process. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief Subnendu. Now, uh, to you, Swift, um, Mr. Shirish, um, you, you've been hearing uh, us talking about these uh, linkages, and, and these bilateral linkages or multilateral in the making um, do happen because of this motivation of of, of addressing the pain points in traditional cross-border payments through correspondent banking networks, which are costly, which take like T plus two um, days to, to arrive, and uh, it's not that quite transparent. You never know what cost you're paying or, or the beneficiary uh, uh, doesn't know. Um, uh, this has been in, 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 in the making for like uh, 50 years. Uh, how has SWIFT uh, responded to this? And, and what new innovations uh, has uh, SWIFT brought about to address these uh, very paid points? Thank you again. I think first I should realize that I'm very happy that similar words around the SWIFT strategy are, are being talked about. Simple, fa seamless, uh, you know, interconnectivity, interoperability, and that, that this is important that the community that, SWIFT is a community which is a, owned by banks, we are a cooperative that banks own. So it's great that we resonate what the banks want to solve for. Uh, in that same resonation, what we will talk a little bit talk about GPI. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice time to look back and see what was delivered. So today we have, on a, let's talk about adoption first. Right? On an adoption level, we have around 2,000 banks who do GPI transactions across the world. Uh, roughly 80% of all cross-border transactions on SWIFT are GPI fully GPI enabled, which means you get the same transparency, traceability, end-to-end -end, uh, SLA of delivering the payment in, in faster, faster time frame, and the full data guarantee that starts and ends. What have we, this, this adoption statistics should also, real, should, is there some real value or just this adoption? No, there is real value. The real value means that we are seeing roughly 50% of payments start from account to account. I'm not talking about bank to bank, I'm talking about starting payment from an account, terminating an account, 50% of those payments are getting delivered in five minutes or less, right? This is the real power of what the community has come together to deliver that we realized that we need to create a faster, efficient layer of SWIFT payments, which is GPI. Uh, we actually deliver, sorry. Uh, 
around 100% of the payments get delivered within a day. Uh, that's the real value that's generating. So around half a trillion payments every day are GP executed. So there is some real value we created. And it's not just about making payments faster, but for banks, like Sapnandu was referring to manual activities, because of the fact that the payments are now traceable, the number of inquiries have come down. Number of complaints have come down. Investigations are easier. Because we didn't just stop, stop at making GPI uh, as just traceable. We added services over it. We added stop and recall, allowing pay transactions to be immediately withdrawn from the network if you detect something wrong with the transaction or there's a cancellation. We've added stuff like case management, which is helping banks to investigate the, 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 uh, the payment. So payments five years ago and payments today are very different. Yes, it's a, the, the problem or the challenge that we have as, as Swift is that we want to do this on an open network. It's an open loop network. Uh, schemes or, or closed loop networks actually control a lot more endpoints. You control the start point, you control the end point, you have bilateral connectivity at times. So you have much more control on the network, but Swift is open loop. We want everybody to wake up, we want you to realize that and, and work together and innovate along with us. So that's one thing. Uh, at the same time, I want, to, I want to refer back to interoperability or, or, or and why it is important. So we would also help want to help the interoperability conditions because we've realized over time a lot of digital islands have got created, whether it is CBDCs or even RTGSs. We are very happy to interconnect anything with value to help provide the standardized standards so, so as to try and make sure that the effectiveness of a multilateral connection or a bilateral connection that Swapnand was talking about can be much more efficient. You can, you can just rely on a single standard or a single connection you have where Swift or otherwise to be able to start connecting to those networks so that we don't lose value, we don't lose the, the fact that you are driving innovation. At the end of the day, our job and the, the mission of Swift is towards the financial community and we want to drive you know, inclusive digital economy via, via the mission that we have at Swift. Maybe you so, should, uh, you should uh, if we ever do a public uh, uh, public uh, what do you call RFP, you should pitch for the ASEAN plus five. <laughs> done. <laughs> done. My, my team is listening, so done. <laughs> no, but I think, I think there is value because over time we have done so many different things and I think, for example, recently we announced connectivity from a CBDC to yeah. RTGS. Now, CBDC network to RTGS, but it is still, tech, like something you said, this technical connectivity. There's a lot more work Indeed. that we have to do with all of you to make sure that the legal connectivity, the, the process connectivity all works. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a great time for payments. I personally believe, and this is not just Swift, but I believe this, that payments is the most collaborative challenge of our times. If we solve this, there is prosperity and growth for all at the end of that, of that rainbow. Mm. You know, okay. b before you go, very quick one. Please. You know, one of the challenges of this multilateral connectivity will be, you remember when we connected, we almost forced, banks are here, right? Yeah. We forced <laughs> banks to get, get off 70% of the revenue. <laughs> now, imagine if you're going to multilateral, why do you think banks are incentivized to let go 70% of the revenue from existing revenue pool? That's a huge elephant in the room. Right. Because by connecting our payment system, democratizing democratizing the network and making it as a social good, you are we are going to tell banks, you must get rid of 70% of money you're making out of moving money. That's a it's shift. A That's a it's shift. A tough call, but it's a very tough call. And that is a bigger problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Which then leads me to, as a banker, yes. uh, how do you <laughs> respond to this? Um, actually, Gung Tai was like uh, pioneering from PayPay Pay Now as well, and and also the NetQR was pioneered by by uh, linkage with with uh, your bank, and um, also your bank is has um, customers can can use uh, Gung Tai Bank to engage in tra swift transactions with with uh, other countries. So, yeah. with all the various. Um, um, mechanics uh, at hand. How do you respond to this and, and, and the future? Please I know. Remember that the, the three percent target of <laughs> moving money. Yes, uh, <laughs> the, the, there's a target, and, and now I, I think to begin with, because when, when you mentioned something like when we start from uh, bilateral uh, connectivity, right? We start from payments, not remittances, because of they're less complex right. in terms of regulatories. Right. So payment is very simple because we just transact like you pay cash, but you place cash with something else like mobile phone, QR, whatever. <clears throat> but limited is another animal, right? We talk about this 
three years ago, we talked about this pay 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 now. First thing that comes to my mind is that hey, it's going to be very really simple, like like QR payments, right? It's, we have connecting with the switch to switch already. We just enhance it so it become like a really intense. But you know what? The thing is, the funny thing is that right now you can go to Singapore, you can make payment to QR code payment for taxi using whatever banks right now in Thailand. Any bank now can do it. Uh, for Kung Thai, we can scan and make payment. But you know what? In Singapore, Grabs take the other way. They take prompt pay pay now for receiving cash. They're not living, using QR payment. So I think the adoption is kind of like when we got used to it, right? It doesn't matter for the recipient side. They can using QR for payment or even international remittance. And thank for that because prompt pay international it's very low value transaction fees, right? So it's very suitable for taxi driver or grabs to take money from a foreigner. You know, imagine you can transfer money from my wallet account to the grab driver, real time. It doesn't really happen in other and other global you know markets. It's just the first time we do it. So we think this is, bilateral is not <clears throat> um, it's a bad guy. We start with the bilateral because see the adoption is now uh, popularity. We can see transaction it coming growing every day, right? But talking about multilaterals. I think that's another story. You mentioned something like Lekura like Tree is different, right? Even bilateral would take three years. But multilateral should be take more than five years, right? But at the end of the, 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 the game here, we think about how they make people who travel not only to Singapore, to Indonesia, to Malaysia, they can use the same experience, right? They can do some kind of this QR payment. Right now, Thailand also have connectivity from ITMX to Indonesia already, and other six countries. And Singapore also connect to India already. Actually, we connect the dots, right? We can have the networks already. But how to build that network more efficiently, that's the key. Because of every hubs or every stop, right, when you do some kind of money transfer, there will be three, three things in the procedure. First, even the sending bank or receiving money to do some kind of verifications, approval, and then settlement, right? And those three things are very costly uh, to the bank operator. Cutting down revenue, it doesn't really you know, uh, matter, but how are we going to make sure that the transaction could be uh, lower cost, and at the same time, we cut down from large volume. For example, like you mentioned, 10,000 can break down into four transactions. The fee can cut by four times, right? And the bank can actually losing something, but can gain more scales on that one. So I think that's the game that we are talking about for, for a bank perspective. So the banks are losing something, but they gain some other things too. So. <laughs> and, and the that's point, a good thing. Uh, yeah. the, the point is that I was a former banker, so the former bank gave me wakes up sometimes. Uh, is that if you don't disrupt yourself, somebody will disrupt you. So the, the chasing value versus chasing pricing is two different things and it's too fair to banks the they were running extremely expensive payment system before this so the cost of infrastructure thanks to gpi and all this thing has con come down but the but the fees didn't come proportionate to the efficiency i think that's what happened quite possible it from time to time it will lower soon now <laughs> yeah, thank you <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, talking about banks, uh, we have we can't mention um, the the other player in, in, in the room, which is non-banks, right? Uh, and uh, we've recently seen um, new waves of, of non-bank uh, uh, payment providers come into play. Um, as a regulator, Chief Samnendu, how do you see this competition well, play? What out? I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm sure my fellow regulators will not like it. Uh, you know, even in Singapore. It took us time to allow non-bank players to connect to our faster payment system. And it took time because under this, banks were telling, they are not, the systems are not good. If they connect to our faster payment system, they will cause more systemic raise, a whole set of things. And we had to argue saying that I can bet that the new fintech companies, the systems are far superior than bank system. You just don't want to acknowledge that. They may have a weak governance structure, fair, that's a fair assessment. Fintechs don't have a strong governance structure as banks being regulated do it. All we need to do is to set up a higher regulatory standard for this fintechs to be up there. 
but I don't see a technology gap between them and the bank, which should be a barrier to connectivity. So we fix that. So today in Singapore, non-banks can connect to the fast payment system. Even for connecting to the pay, pay, pay now, cure, uh, prompt pay, there, there's a scheme we created. There's also a barrier to connect there. So my sense is that the non-bank player today by design have a better ability to deal with low value, multiple payment mode, whether it's merchant acceptance or the peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfer. And also, they also use same data to issue other banking services like credit services based on payment data. So they have this innovation aspect to that. Plus, today we know banks don't serve every customer. 30 to 40 percent of our population are unbanked. And banks are not going to serve them anyway. They're not, today, today you look at today's statistics, 50% unbanked, who is going to serve them? It'll be the non-bank. And if you don't allow non-banks to participate in the network, how are you going to solve that problem? So one option could be the non-bank can create their own network and operate. But we cannot deny 50% of our population in the Asian market access to financial services and then tell the non-banks who are serving them should not be allowed on the network. That doesn't work. So in my sense, the two things will happen. First thing, most regulators will start thinking of bringing them to the network, at least on the payment rails. They will serve this un unbanked sector at a different price point. And perhaps they may think about an alternate uh, clearing system. I think in India, if I don't know, you, they started put, thinking about computing clearing houses, right? The second clearing house could be there's another way to do it. So there's this new thinking coming around non-bank players, but we cannot deny them participating in the network and helping large, almost 50% of our population who are today, not, today are not banked by the banks. Thank you very much. So a uh, very interesting uh, point you made here. Let me throw the question to Kuntiti Pong now. As a banker, um, you've heard that, that for Singapore, it took a while for uh, non-banks to be able to access the, the uh, payment rails. Um, um, uh, is that possible in the future for Thailand uh, as well as um, the owner of, of, of the, our own rail? Um, and what do you see? Uh, could, um, Chief Subnandu also mentioned uh, the financial inclusion uh, perspective of, of this issue, how um, the uh, non-banks may um, um, help this, this, uh, address this issue too. So perhaps some, some key uh, thoughts from you on, on these two um, ideas. Thank you for that question. I think it's interesting when we talk about this, right? We've been fighting with non-banks so many, many, many rounds and many years. And we are also, I used to be the chairman of the non-bank association as well before I joined the bank. I know how to think, how they thought about this. And I know how painful they gone through this one. I knew that in future we cannot just, you know, uh, stop them. I think to be fair, on the, talk about two, three things, right? Level of paying fuels, right? I think that one, we already lift up some standard already. Uh, I see a lot of the uh, non-bank or fintech is now lift up the, uh, the compliance uh, standards now already. The KYC process now has been approved. So sooner or later, I think there will be no objections that not allow them to join the network. But I think the focus thing that I have to in my mind is two words that I have in my mind now is it's financial inclusions and also the innovations. Right? I think these two things need to be um, uh, you know, more open up for any players. Bank can do some at certain level, but talk about non-bank and fintechs, right? This also can answer in terms of reaching out to a very long tail customers. At the same time, innovation that the bank cannot be compete with the fintech. So I think these two things can enrich out to those unbanked customers. Uh, same thing that we are talking about this, I think KDB or Group Thai Bank also very concerned on this one because we are one of the government bank that trying to lift up their financial inclusion services to those unbanked customers. Uh, very lucky that we also have some kind of uh, a government project that we already supported. We have about 40 million customers which is using the mobile application called Baotang apps. Those customers, I think almost all of them could be under, un, under consideration as unbanked customer segment and reach, reach out to those customers with the government subsidies program already. So the, 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 the way that we can reach out to this one is already there. Technology is already there. They already adopted the, the technology already. 
So I think it doesn't matter. It could be non-bank or even KDB can do ourselves by reaching out for those customers. And especially for Thailand, we are not just sending money back to uh, other country. We are receiving bank. So majority of people in Thailand, 70% of the volume internationally emitted, it's inward to Thailand. And talking about those actually using, uh, you know, living in up country whereby they have families, they have a daughter and brother uh, and sister, whatever, working in other country as a migrant worker. When they send back home money, the process, you know, as you mentioned, they'd wait for four, four months or six months to send, to send money back home because of the, the fee, it's, it's, it'd be a, a hurdle for them because cost per transit is going to be very high. So that's why if you talk about the finite inclusion and make sure the net the rail is uh, more efficiency, the cost along the way is cheaper. So meaning we can direct transfer from the migrant worker in Singapore or in Indonesia back to their hometown, their parents, to their wallets. And that, that could be another game changer for, for finite inclusion. It doesn't matter that KDB can do it. I think, to be fair, I think if non-bank and fintech can do it, I think that should be uh, one of the things that uh, we cannot stop it. Okay, good, good to see you that you're an agnostic on, on this, and that um, efficiency would lead to uh, more financial inclusion. Uh, now, we've but, but, but I think he, I, yeah. we should not forget, he made a very good point. We cannot give fintech a free pass to the rails just because they're serving unbanked. Mm. They must step up to the regulatory obligations like a bank, mm. and that's non-negotiable. Mm. Yes, of course. The, all the prudential requirements for, um, uh, like, like a bank, should should be there for uh, regulating these companies too. Uh, now, could uh, Mr. Shirish, you've heard um, us talk about uh, all these um, retail payment um, linkages and 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 cross-border retail payments. Um, uh, Swift has been. Uh, mostly catered to towards uh, business B two B payments uh, among companies. Now, do you intend to um, see a place where Swift um, uh, would focus on on retail payments as well? So it's a very interesting question. So, technically speaking, Swift is value agnostic. We do not consider because we whatever payments come through banks, we deliver. So it's not about Swift caters to only B two B payments or not. So. And anyway, the GPI wave raised all the ships. So every single payment that went via, via Swift became efficient. Now, if we really come to low value payments, and which is also similar to retail payments and or SME payments, that's, that's the fastest growing segment on payments today, not just on Swift, but globally. And Sapnandu also referred to it about how fast this segment is growing, not just for the unbanked, but even at the banked level. And there are multiple reasons for this. There's, uh, we heard the session earlier about Web 3.0, Web 3.0, and, and the integration of of financial services inside the the internet. But today, a lot of these financial services are already integrated inside the processes of the companies. So accounts payable has become really efficient, Pe uh, automated, uh, better systems like faster payments in in Singapore and 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 PromPay has probably led to more corporate payments going on that rail. Uh, than, than typically over ACH or RTGS. So considering all of these conversations in mind, we said we should focus something on the low value side of the payment trail because the reason that we was, we, the, what customers want there actually is, is, is guaranteed value cost, uh, full value delivery, which means the payment reaches, if you send 1,000 baht, 1,000 baht gets there. We want that and we want it to be done faster uh, in time. So we actually went to what is called now as Swift Go. Now Swift Go is a, is a, is a variant on GPI. So it has the same platform benefits of GPI, traceability, transparency, end-to-end -end visibility of the payment, but it has a higher standard, which is banks have to collaborate and create a single price point. They have to collaborate and make sure the pay payment is not deducted across the way. And they have to deliver the payment faster than they would deliver a GPI payment. Now this is what we have on Swift Go. We already have around 400 banks signed up. Uh, 100 banks will go live before the end of the year. Uh, around 30, 40 of them already alive. And e even with the banks are live, we are actually seeing roughly around 87% payments getting delivered in five minutes or less. So to the extent that what we are trying to do with, uh, with, with, with specific to low value payments, it is our focus on retail incidentally did because it, that's where the low value payment growth is. So we are agnostic to value, but we are focused on the retail segment because of the tremendous volume potential it has. 
Yes, indeed. Um, well, I, time's almost up. Well, um, let me ask you to take, take out your crystal balls and, and tell us what's going to happen in, say, five years in terms of cross-border payment landscape. Oh. Uh, begin with you, uh, Chief Subnendu. So, so by collecting our our prompt pay pay now, we brought down the 15% cost of a $100 transfer to 3% plus minus. Can we reduce the 3% to less than a dollar? To me, that's the intermediate future. And to answer that, large, I think today we believe CBDC is the answer. Because the networks are connected, what we need to do, find an elegant way to do, do an atomic reconciliation on the policy side and some reconciliation side. There's no better instrument than a wholesale CBDC to do it. I think the project Dunbar and project Jura and all these projects central banks are doing, it, uh, uh, Thailand is doing with Hong Kong, Ethion. Uh, so all these projects will lead to this conclusion that you need to have a wholesale CBDC which can be used to reduce this cost of transfer from 3% to less than 1% for the loss of revenue um, for banks uh, because the cost has to go down there. The second uh, uh, one will be much more dramatic. Today the when we pay somebody for taking ownership of an asset, it's a two-step process. I, 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 I want to buy that chair from that gentleman. Uh, we agree for a, for a price. I take ownership by paying him. Two, two processes, right? And the ownership transfer typically takes T plus two, T plus three. There are many processes. And the payment process also may take time because till that's settled, you don't actually transfer the money. The future will be a single transaction. The transfer of ownership and the transfer of payment are atomic, running on a single network. And the answer to that is a digital currency, which is a new form of money of existing fiat, which will be used to settle this transaction. So to me, the future is a single transaction of ownership transfer and transfer of value. So this too will make the whole payment process completely upside down. OK. Wow. Uh, what a future. Now to you, Mr. Shirish. Um, what do you see in, in the next five years? So I'll add two other elements to this conversation. I'll add the element of data. Mm -hmm. I think as payments become richer and richer, ISO carrying so much information on the payment, and they become faster, we will start having payments that are aware of, data aware or context aware. I know I'm buying a chair. The payment will be context aware of what it's supposed to do, and we can then apply better processing rules that's another way of bringing the payment cost down because it's not just about making the payment faster, but we also have to make it lighter. So context-aware payments because of data are something that I would really want to bet on. The second thing I'm going to bet on is uh, the payments will slightly start. I would love for them to disappear, which means that not that they will disappear, that I don't owe you any money, but the fact that it, they become machine to machine. So we'll have a lot more payments going beyond automate inside the process itself. Something like Sipnando's point, uh, not necessarily CBDC or otherwise, I don't, I'm not quite, quite agnostic to that. But machine to machine payments require a much more stronger connection, better standards, translation error, no translation error, nobody sitting and repairing payments. So we want to see that level of automation that will drive the, 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 the progress and, and the commerce forward. Thank you. Um, Kun uh, Kittipong, please. Mm -hmm. You already have my answer already. But I'll, 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 the last one, I think there are two things that I have to mention here. First, I agree that CBDC is the final answer. Um, by doing that, I think the aims of uh, our, as a banker, we also try to reduce the cost, the fee to the customer. That's the ultimate goal, right? We aim to get less than $1 per transaction. But we're fighting for that. And we've been fighting for that for many, for many conversations. How are we going to reduce that to $1 fee, right? Because of the cost is all the way. The bank A and bank B need to do process, the same process, verifications, authentications, and approve it, and process, and settlements, right? Those kind of thing is cost. If you add up the cost, right, all the, the value chain, it's going to be more than $1. But if CBDC comes into play, it would reduce all the unnecessary costs. For example, like the settlement with no settlement at all. Unlike the fiat currency right now we're using, we don't have to go and verify point by point because we already know the ownership of the money, who's sending, who's receiving. So that kind of thing, can, if we can get rid of those kind of unnecessary protocol, we reduce a, lot, a huge cost of it. So that's what we end up with low value 
cost for those actually transact uh, for all customers. The other point that I think we'll mention here is on the payment size, right? We see a lot of people adopting in Thailand. It's very much in terms of cake, uh, 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 prompt pay pay now. But we talk about when you go abroad, right? The same experience. If you going to make some payment at the shops in Singapore, you very uncomfortable to show your mobile phone and say, hey, I want to pay by QR codes, right? So I think the piece that we are going to talk about here is how to have a standardized communication, education to those customer. When you see this local, you can make payment there. Similar thing as in Thailand, if you go into the shop right now in Thailand, if you ask for the bill, you don't need to tell them that you need to pay by QR code. You just show your phone. They will bring you the QR paper and you can scan. Same thing, if we can do the same thing, we just flash the QR code there in Singapore and the merchant come up with, hey, this is your QR mode payment. And this is going to be more and more adoption in terms of the uh, education. So that's why I think that in the next five years, I would like to see that we have a single uh, vision that amongst a country corridor in AP or in Southeast Asia, we could have something like a symbolic that we can endorse it and say, this is our cross-border network payment, mm -hmm. similar to Alipay Plus is now doing. Mm -hmm. They're across the, the region using Alipay Plus as a logo for commodity, but they can see this, they can make a payment there. So I think that's what we, we want to see in, a few, in the next five years from now. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very interesting discussion. Um, with changed um, the landscape of, of cross-border payments and the way users um, um, are using cross-border payments uh, in the past two or three years. And, and what we've heard just now is that the future looks even brighter uh, than, than the present right now. So uh, please give a big hand to all three uh, panelists here, uh, Chief of Nendu, uh, Mr. Shirish, and Kun Kitiplong. Thank you very much. Um, before we close this session, let me remind you that there's a uh, live demonstrations of uh, QR cross-border payments down, downstairs in the library on the second floor between uh, Thailand and Indonesia. So the assistant governors of uh, the Bank of Thailand and Bank of Indonesia are there to demonstrate live QR um, demonstrations of, of, of cross-border payments. Thank you very much. Uh, please stand for a quick photo. Thank you very much to all the panelists for the fruitful discussion on enhancing frictionless cross-border payment for all. And once again, thank you to our co-host, the Thai Bankers Association and Payment System Office. That was such an insightful session on cross-border payments. And we are hoping that, you know, traveling into Singapore will be much easier when we are performing payments.